Hello, everybody, and welcome. It is our second book chat, and it's exciting because we do, in fact, have another um, art educator, but this also crosses over into um, the classroom. So before I give anything away, a couple things that I want to tell you is there is a little project associated with this. So grab a sheet of paper. I mean, it can even be just um, you know, a piece of copy paper, but grab a sheet of paper, any, even a um, grocery bag, you know, just something you can write on. Um, if you have some crayons, markers, even just a pen, grab that and a scissors and you'll be all set. We want this to be super interactive. So we want you to ask questions. There's a control panel on the side that has questions. So type in your questions um, and we will monitor the questions. Um, our guest does not have to worry about questions. We'll get them to you. Um, and so this is like a sport, like total interactive. And make sure that you have a ton of fun. I know that I will have a blast because I met Sarah um, a long time ago when she was the Youth Art Month coordinator. So full of energy, so full of fun, so passionate for her students. And I just was like, I need to know this person and be her friend. And I'm so super proud of this book. I am Chris Bakke. I'm the Customer Engagement Manager for Art at NASCO. And I'm Jenny Calvitis. I'm the Customer Engagement Manager for Career Readiness at NASCO, uh, which includes social emotional learning. So I'm so excited to be here talking with, with Sarah about social emotional learning and how that kind of ties into this amazing book. And unlike Chris, I'm at I met Sarah 15 minutes ago, um, but I have read the book and it is phenomenal. So with that, we are gonna turn the stage right over to you, Sarah, and we're gonna let you tell a little bit about what prompted you to write it. And then if you could start us off by actually reading the book, that would be outstanding. Yes, absolutely. Well, hello everybody. I'm so excited to be here. I absolutely just love talking to people about this, but also just kind of interacting with people regarding talking about mental health, right? And we can code it in many different ways, whether we're talking to students or to each other. It's something that is always on the forefront of my mind, especially this year. So I'm really excited to have that be part of my book a little bit, but also just part of our normal conversation. So for those of you that don't know me, my name is Sarah Krajewski. I have been teaching art for 10 years. Feels like one, feels like 40, but it's, it's been super fun. This year has been crazy. Um, but I teach in Cambridge in Wisconsin, and I also um, do a lot of other things kind of like on the side, my own art making, and um, try to stay as much connected as I can with being an artist in addition to an art educator. So um, Chris, you were asking a little bit about what prompted me to write the book, right? So here's here's the main the main thing that happened. Okay, so March of last year, pandemic hits, feelings happen, right? <laughs> there were many times where I was like, I don't even know how I feel. I feel really numb. I feel confused. I'm emotional and then I'm not emotional. I'm anxious and then I'm okay. It was like the list goes on, right? The feelings that I personally was feeling, mm -hmm. a grown woman who has a pretty decent handle on my anxiety, though it does come back every once in a while and it's one of my good friends. It was really hard for me to understand how I felt about my normal life. So in turn, I was thinking, well, this has gotta be hard for kids too and other people, right? So I um, had actually wanted to write a book for a while and luckily I already had kind of a connection with a local um, publisher called Orange Hat Publishing and they're out of um, Waukesha, super little indie um, group of publishers and they had already known me and they, we had an idea or I had an idea of a book I was originally going to do. And then once the pandemic hit, it was like, okay, just write something and scrap the more complicated, like there was something that had to do with materials. It was, it was more complicated because that's how I roll. So <laughs> we took it down a little bit and I just started storyboarding this idea for acknowledging and expressing and coming to terms with any type of feeling that we have. So that's where the title exactly you and the shape of your feelings comes from is because I am um, 
I am drawn to abstract art by nature. Um, so my book is filled with these abstract shapes and mm -hmm. um, they're all hand collaged and cut and same with the, the artwork that's in the book. So I wanted to try to encourage conversations about feelings and about um, the, the way that we interpret the world through colorful abstract art. So within the book, there are a lot of words, a lot of, a lot of big feelings, but it's hopefully a little more palatable because it's through like the eye of a, of a fun, colorful children's book. So that's it. Should we read? Yes. Okay, let's do it. So I'm hoping that if I do it like how I read for my virtual learners, because naturally I'm still teaching students online and in person. So if I just hold it like this for you, can we see that okay? Beautiful. Yes. Okay. Exactly you, the shape of your feelings. What do feelings look like? Your feelings are a beautiful work of art. Happy shapes, adventurous lines, and energetic colors make up your masterpiece. We are all different. Every shape, color, and line has something special that makes it unique. What makes you unique? You are unique when you are exactly you. It sure is awesome to be you, but sometimes it can be a little hard. Do you ever get nervous to be exactly you? Or worried what someone might think? Or afraid of how you feel? Or scared of what might happen? Those feelings are normal. Sometimes those feelings are called anxiety. It can feel like you are made up of knots and scribbles. But guess what? Those feelings can be good. Those feelings can help you practice being strong and brave. With practice, your feelings can do lots of amazing things. Have you ever felt a little sad and gray? Sometimes those feelings are called depression. It can feel like you live under a storm cloud or that you're asleep even when you're awake. It's okay to have those feelings too because those feelings can help you notice when you're happy. Happiness can feel warm like the sun. And when you feel warm like the sun, you can make others feel warm too. How can you share your happiness? You can be kind. You can make it rain kindness. What feeling helps you spread your kindness? Confidence. When you believe in yourself, you feel tall and proud like a mountain. You know what you are capable of. Confident flowers don't compare themselves to other flowers. They just bloom. Your shapes, colors, and lines dance inside you, creating a beautiful masterpiece. You are an amazing work of art, and your feelings make you exactly you. That's it. So good. Thank so you. Good. I love the um, little snail at the end because I yes. know that's kind of a signature Sarah kind of thing. So yes. um, my little I snail totally... is always, always part, always there. <laughs> is there any significance to a snail? Yeah, a little bit. I mean, I've always kind of loved that animal, that little creature, just because the fact that it goes so slow, but it still feels kind of purposeful is just like the epitome of intention, right? So doing something intentionally. Um, and then I do also just have a personal connection to it. Um, my mom had gotten sick with a very uh, mm -hmm. debilitating disease a few years ago um, and took her almost nine months to get through that with therapy and OT and physical therapy and all these things. And so to celebrate the slow successes that she had, we would always, um, this is the inner teacher in me, we would write like her I can statements of what she can do or what she was able to accomplish on these little paper snails. So slowly she would start kind of like earning these snails as she started to like, I can, I can safely swallow my food. I can learn how to walk. I can, you know, all these, all these things that was, were slow progress. Um, and that snail is is a good representation of how we don't need to rush, we don't need to have it be perfect, but we can just kind of make intentional choices and follow that path. 
That is so fantastic. And um, she's a teacher too, right? She is, yeah. She teaches in the same district as me. Um, she teaches middle school. So praise to all you middle school people. I don't know how you do it. I, I taught kindergarten mm -hmm. through eighth grade for four years before this, and middle school is both wonderful and very difficult. <laughs> so <laughs> she, um, I actually did a read aloud with her students because they are in the same district. So they had me as, a, as an art teacher. So when we were doing virtual learning, I was a guest author in my mom's class and I read the book with them and they all obviously remembered me from when I taught them art. So it was a, it's a fun connection. Definitely. And middle school, you're right, is the plethora of, um, you have some that are, that are so very still immature and some that are mature beyond their years. And so it's interesting, but I, I like the idea that this book is definitely geared to elementary, but I mean, you can read it in so many different circles. I, I enjoy that too. So at this stage of the game, everybody, if you do have a question, feel free to type it in and Jenny and I will read it. We, we definitely have some questions ready for you as well. Yeah. So do you want me to kick off with a question? Please okay. do. So one of the questions we have for you is, you also illustrated the book. Can you explain how you decided what you were going to do? Yes. So the illustration was, um, was actually really interesting for me just because I, so again, I create abstract art. I usually just kind of work it intuitively. So I'll just like, pick colors and I'll just kind of go to town and I don't plan as much when I create my abstract pieces. But for this, you have to plan way more because everything that I created, the text has to live in a certain space. So like, for example, on this spread, like I, I to back it up just a little bit, I created all the pieces out of collage and paint. So there is a matching spread of this in my like stack of original pieces that don't have the text in it, right? So there's an original one in here that has the actual paint and splatter paint and knots and scribbles and stuff all over it. And then I scanned in those original collaged images and hand wrote the text in my iPad and kind of got the text I wanted. So every single part in the book um, was created by me, which was really fun to, to lay out. But admittedly, it was so different than how I usually work because I, I couldn't just say, oh, this will, this will probably work for the flow that I want the page to be. Um, so I sort of had to slow myself down a little bit like a snail and <laughs> tell myself to just like step back a little bit. I went back to my drawing board and I got my original iPad sketches that I had drawn like quickly digitally. And I ended up taking a few extra goes at those to make them exactly how I wanted them to be so that I could just create my images like a map. Um, because initially I was kind of just following my heart and doing what I was gonna do and then it was not as precise as it needed to be. So um, I typically work with um, interior house paint, which is really fun. So I just get a bunch of like interior house paint samples. I use um, spray paint. I call that my pepper. So I like pepper all of my little images. Um, I usually include like knots and scribbles. I've been doing um, some kind of stenciling. So there are like some harder edges on some of mine and some different kinds of textural elements. So I really had fun going close to my abstract style, but a little bit more um, relatable because some of the images are obviously like they're a nod to something that already exists, right? So it was really fun for me to sort of storyboard them out and stick with my same style, but um, feel really good about, about the way that they look. So yes, for the most part, they are all painted paper that's collaged and um, have, again, like the original pieces, right? I could pull that off if I want to but I'm not gonna, um, <laughs> and, I, <laughs> and then um, scanned those images in and then filled in my text. So it was a really great learning curve for me to figure out how to plan a little bit more than I initially would. So I was kind of modeling that when my students asked me about it. it it's a really great thing for me to share with them. It's a lot more planning than my typical way of working. Very cool. Wonderful, so we do have another question. Um, and actually, I think this is a great question because of all the amazing, intricate conversation you just had about what you did. Um, how long did it take you to go through the steps of this project? Yeah, so that one um, is interesting just because typically creating a book, um, 
it usually takes at least a year or longer just because once you start working with your publisher, there are many different steps that need to happen first just to initially plan things like what size is the book going to be? How, you know, how many pages are there going to be? What, what kind of spine do we want? Like all those sort of logistical details. So from start to finish, meaning like the initial storyboard where I was like, okay, I think I've got it. I think I know where I'm gonna head to actually having the physical book in my hands was probably actually about nine or 10 months. So it was a little faster than typical. Um, and part of that just was because I was, um, shall I say, a little pushy with my publishers in the way that I said, listen, people need this book, my friends. <laughs> so <laughs> so um, they, we worked together and I said, I think in the fall is gonna be a really cool time to bring it out. So um, I worked really hard over the summer and essentially did about a spread a day um, because obviously like getting all my papers ready and things like that too, each of, each of these illustrations took me you know, a, a day or so to create half a day. And then um, and then the text was its own sort of thing. So um, yeah, many, many steps. And then what I didn't expect was at the end, um, a lot of very small decisions in the final push about like things you just don't think about, right? When you do like a painting or you create a piece out of ceramics, when it's done, it's, it's done. But when you're creating a book, there are so many components to it like what's like we were working on the spine of the book for the last week like trying to get the spine to line up the way that we wanted and how, where should my last name be it was just very interesting to see that process so um to sum it up about nine months ish but that was also partly because i had had a relationship with my publisher beforehand since we had been discussing a different idea that i had um so if i didn't have that it probably would have taken me just a touch longer um, question for you from our audience. Um, when you share this book with your students, do you have an associated art project you do with them? I feel like we paid you to ask that question. So <laughs> what good planning? I mean, we can just we'll just ask that right before we do our project again. No. <laughs> um, so yes, actually in the back of the book, because I am obviously a teacher and I love to give resources to people. The very last page in the book looks like this. So um, for hopefully parents and guardians and people that are reading this with younger kiddos or obviously just themselves, um, I do have some guiding questions here so that as the book is read or when it's done, you don't have to stop there and just close it up and be done. But again, sort of furthering that conversation. So thinking about um, when do you feel happy? Do you ever feel anxious? How do you feel right now, right? So those guiding questions are a big part of how to have that conversation. And then on this side, huh, art projects, baby. <laughs> so these oh. are three, <laughs> three projects um, that I thought of that are using super simple supplies that are, have, are really good at starting conversations. We will be doing this one, I'm thinking, today. Um, it's my favorite. I've presented it a few times to students and teachers and adults, and it's just a really good way to start conversations. So that's called the circle of control. Um, I do have, this one is just a little rays of happiness, so trying to encourage students to think positively about what makes them happy, what can help them spread their happiness, um, and, and sort of like listing those things even sometimes sort of secretly on the back of their paper and then the last one is um, unique feelings and this is sort of just encouraging that more abstract intuitive mindset um, abstraction in my opinion can be really tricky for especially young students to grasp so showing them pages like um, the pages where we're all kind of I'll get it we're all sort of there we go like all unique different feelings and mm -hmm. modeling to them like this, this particular shape kind of feels like it's sort of curled up and maybe reverting a little bit, right? Or pulling back. This shape looks like they got a lot going on and they're maybe in their, in their head a little bit. So I'll use it sometimes to show them that shapes can be, almost go hand in hand with a feeling, right? So the shape of your feelings is, is that way to help them think about the fact that it doesn't need to be a word to label how you feel, but instead can be um, a shape to, or a piece of art to help you think about, about your feelings. So yes, a few projects here, and then um, there's, many, there's many other ones, and lots of other amazing art teachers um, that have 
purchased my book and done their own spin on it in their own classroom. Um, I've seen some really cool self portraits with students and then they've got like all these feelings, you know, popping out of their heads. Um, they, I've seen some really amazing um, spins on these abstractions. So it's really cool just to think about how you can read a book and then take it a little bit further. I love it. Um, and I love the spins that art teachers give on any lesson, any book yeah. lesson like you give, you know, it's like, it's like the give a mouse a cookie book. You know what I mean? You give an art teacher an idea and oh my gosh, they just springboard all over it. How about um, you touched super briefly on your own anxiety. And so I think that's really brave to share that. And so as you're talking and using words like anxiety and depression, do you worry that it's going to get scary in the classroom? Do you worry that there might be tears or that somebody tells something about their mom or their dad or yeah. something like that? Great. No, that is an excellent question. And I even, um, I was, I talked to a lot of people about how to approach that um, because I, I personally am of the belief that when we talk to, to kids and students in particular, to use real language with them, right? So that it's not like a fluffy way of discussing something. And sometimes those analogies and comparisons can help. Of course, that's helpful. Um, but I wanted students to have a word for how they how they felt or how they saw people feeling. Um, and being able to describe that in a way that feels maybe more attainable, like knots and scribbles inside of you or um, feeling like you're there's a storm cloud over you. Um, and I actually, I once I was done with my book and it was just about to be published, I read it out loud to my therapist on the on our video chat. And I spoke with her and I said, what do you think about this? How do you feel? So she was a great sounding board for me too, about using those words, anxiety, depression, um, confidence, those things What that seems a little bit scary to have in a kid's book, but something that most likely they've either heard or have maybe have questions about, right? Um, the And I guess that brings me next to the fact that if a student themselves isn't feeling those feelings, they're likely either maybe going to or are connected to someone in their family that does, right? And especially during a time like this where we're so isolated, we're feeling like, I'll admit this last week, I've been incredibly anxious, more so than I have probably all year. So my, my own anxiety is heightened and being able to acknowledge that and say that and not be scared or embarrassed about it is just, again, tearing down those walls to say, it's okay to feel that way, right? I'm having a hard week and that's okay. And I'm not going to die from it. And I'm not going to make other people hurt because of that, but I can acknowledge that it's a way that I feel and what can I do, right? So that's why even like this page is probably one of my favorite pages because I very much relate to it. Um, and this also was very fun to create, um, but the knots and scribbles page, also just reminds me that um, without it becoming a, a sense of toxic positivity, seeing if you can find the that light, find the, the purpose, the positivity from those feelings, right? So we acknowledge somebody might have anxiety. You might get a little bit nervous. You aren't overcome by anxiety. It's not all you are, but you might experience that, right? So then bouncing off of that, teaching students that that feeling and that acknowledgement of, okay, sometimes I get nervous, but wow, it can help me notice when I'm feeling strong. It can help me be really brave when I'm, when I'm scared. It can help me have a toolbox of things that I can do to, to do amazing things with my feelings. So, um, I mean, I had a pretty good support system when I was a kid, um, being really anxious, but I also think if there was, if there was even more so just said, Sarah, I know that you feel anxious, but you are not your anxiety and it's okay to feel that way and you're you're not alone in feeling that way. Um, would even more hit home the fact that um, that all of these feelings are super normal, super normal. Yes, I yeah. love that so much. Because you talked about, you know, um, feeling brave, it also talks in the section 
in the back about um, your mantra. Yeah. And I um, know the and I know the mantra because I have been in your classroom. And <laughs> so tell us a little bit about that because if you have if you don't know Sarah, um, this is something that they do every day in art class. Yeah, absolutely. So um, I always say that my job um, as an art educator is to be there for my students, first and foremost. And I am there for my students mentally, emotionally, and lastly, artistically, right? It comes through through our arts, but I mean, the best example is two days ago, some of my students were having a really emotional time and I had a prep time and they couldn't get in with the counselor. And I'm like, come on in, let's talk it out, right? So my we weren't talking about art, we weren't doing art, but my job is just to be there to support them. So part of how I feel um, I can give them tools for support is to teach them about self-affirmation, the way they talk about themselves, the way they, um, the way they kind of take control over their own learning um, and, and their own day, right? Uh, we, we always read a motivation every day that I see my students in class. So I have a bunch of different books with motivational quotes and things. And um, the one last week was about how positivity is a mindset um, and happiness is a mood. So you can feel positive by making specific choices and your mood of happiness might change that you can't control as much. So the mantra is one way that we practice our correct mindset or the strongest mindset that we can get at the beginning of art. So every single class, every single grade, pre-kindergarten through fifth grade knows the mantra and their emotions that go along with it. And um, I know some other, other, um, some other art teachers have incorporated into their classroom, which is super cool. And some have like added different self-affirmations. So it's in the back of the book, but I'll show you what it looks like. It goes like this. My mantra, I am positive. I am creative. I am mindful. I am amazing. I am an artist, and that's it. But like, that is seriously, actually, yeah, that's <laughs> fantastic. Thank you. <laughs> and you so, know, some, go ahead. I was just gonna say, um, I can only imagine your elementary kids get into it every single time that they start, right? Yes. So it has to just completely change the mood, you know, whatever they walk into, it allows them that space to breathe and then to reset. Yes, exactly. It's kind of like um, routines are really important uh, for me and for students. And that routine of knowing the mantra is always how we start. And we've also, I mean, like I said, these kids have had me for six years by this point. So we switch it up a little bit. I'll always start by saying, first, we're going to take a deep belly breath, right? And we'll do a very slow breath and then we'll be ready for the mantra. So the breath always comes first. And then um, I'll let the kiddos pick how we do the mantra, both the volume and the motions, because listen, they, they've done it with me like 50 times at this point. So sometimes we'll do like tiny motions and like backwards. And so we'll be like, I am amazing, right? Like we just do it silly because we like know the words for it. So we kind of switch it up. Um, and, and sometimes we'll add our own, like this year, a couple of my classes wanted to add, like I am flexible because stuff was changing so much for them. So thought of emotion, I'm flexible. Um, I know one of my great art teacher friends always adds like, I am strong. Um, you know, there's there's different things that, that the students can take ownership over and um, and the, it helps me too, in all honesty. Like when, if I have a rough class and then I have to sit down and greet a new class, like I better be ready for them because I, I gotta be, yeah. you know? So it helps me yeah. to take a deep breath as well. That's fantastic. So as you're rolling this book out, um, clearly you work a lot with elementary students because they are your students, uh, but have you done some outreach to, to older grades to see if it kind of levels up to, you said middle school, but high school and probably even adults, right? Yeah, um, that's a great question. I, I guess I haven't done a specific reading for the upper grades just based on the fact that it's sort of marketed and sort of like, you know, looks like a children's book. But the, the adults that I've read it to, um, especially when I was first kind of going through the process of getting it all written, um, they all said, I need this book, right? It's like, yes, it's a kid's book, but like hearing something, somebody, some book say, it's normal to feel that way is, is affirming. So um, I think 
I would, if anything, I would love to see a high school or an upper elementary or a college spin on it, just because I think they could take that idea of like identifying with a shape or identifying with um, with what those bigger feelings are and sort of pushing it a little bit more, right? Um, almost like illustrating their own their own feeling or illustrating what happens inside their head, but to a more complex level. So um, I think that there's a lot of potential there for sure. Um, but I think the, the most important thing is that it doesn't have to stop at the young kiddos. And I even um, just got a message from one of my great friends yesterday. Her kiddo picked up the book and she was like, oh yeah, that, that's the book that reminds, and keep in mind, this kiddo was like four. But she's like, yeah, that's the book that tells me feelings are okay and that it's okay to cry. <laughs> I was like, yeah, it is. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. I, I hope it inspires people <laughs> of all ages, um, if not to create art, at least to just um, affirm for them that it is okay how you feel. <laughs> And emotional, reg emotional regulation is so important at every age, right? I mean, it's that four-year-old who's like, it's okay to cry, but also, you know, sometimes I need to be told it's okay to cry. Um, uh -huh. so, so that affirmation is, is fantastic. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. That's, that's, that's for <laughs> sure me because, um, you know, some of the talk that we have been having reminds me of that Disney Pixar movie inside out. And, um, I notoriously do put sadness in a circle and, mm -hmm. you know, to have somebody say it's okay to cry, you know, sometimes you, somebody like me just needs that, you know, yeah. um, because, because you can't have true joy without the sadness, you right. know what I mean? Yeah. Um, yeah. And so... I get a little chill when I say that because it took a real long time for Chrissy to figure that one out. <laughs> so, yeah, um, it's, but it, it's, it's, it's really, really hard um, to, to feel that and to recognize that. And there, um, I can't quote the specific um, uh, studies right now because it's my Thursday evening brain is gone, but there are, there are studies that show that um, when we identify and name feelings, then it allows us to understand those feelings better, which is another big reason why I wrote the words anxiety and depression and things like that in the book, because though it might not feel the same for everyone, it can feel like this. And I was really intentional about not saying like, anxiety is this, it was, it might feel like this, it could yes. feel like this. Um, because see, giving kids and humans of all ages the ability to to hear the words and say, oh yeah, you know what? That is an interesting way to say it. Maybe I just need to get my scribbles out. What does that feel like? You know, so. Yeah, anytime you can scribble, it's good. And it's interesting too, because, um, so we partner with our class curator on some curriculum and we've talked a lot about social emotional learning and, and they have sort of an emotional wheel. And um, Cindy Ingram said that um, Brene Brown talks about, um, being able to name emotions and that a lot of people literally can only say like happy, sad, mad. Um, and so just for fun, I tried it with my uh, grandson, Jude, who's six. And um, I was super excited. He got up to six nice. and um, I was really excited because silly was one of them. And I'm like, yes, you are <laughs> we winning as a grandma for sure. <clears throat> Maybe, yes, we should really be able to, maybe we can name the amount of feelings of the age that we are <laughs> and we just keep getting more, you know, he's six. So maybe he only knows six emotions right now. I don't know. <laughs> yes. Um, I just, it, it, it's just neat to have those conversations and they have this book, of course. Um, and so, um, and just so you know that this one isn't their book. This one's actually my book because I needed it too. Um, uh -huh. But it is, it, it's great. Do you, have you done this for like teacher workshops? Yeah, yep. I, um, I have actually presented um, the Circle of Control, which we'll do in a little bit here. I've presented that to um, at the Art of Education University conference um, in summer of this last year. So we did that with, you know, hundreds of art teachers virtually, which was really fun. Um, and then I also have done it through my own staff um, 
for P like professional development. So I reached out to my principal and I said, hey, I've been doing this really cool lesson with my students online, talking about what you can control and what you can't. And I'd love to do it with the staff because all of our meetings are virtual anyways. So I was like, oh, maybe we'll just make a little art. So I made these little kits and I said, all right, this is for our, for our staff meeting on, on Wednesday. And, um, and they all created some art and we had some good conversations with that. So I'll explain to you how it works in a little bit. So good. You keep teasing me with the, the art we're going to do. Should we do it soon? Well, you're in, you're in control. You've got to tell me when it's time. <laughs> <laughs> well, we should, but I will tell you a super funny story is I participated in that conference and did that with you and was super excited. And then I did it with my grandchildren, which was fun because they're littles and they're crazy. But, but it was fun to talk about that. Um, and ironically i still had the circle and the piece um and so um in a recent one-on-one -on -one with my boss um he said any question or any concerns and i listed a concern and he kind of looked at me and i said at the end of the day it's all about your circle of control and i i showed him and i'm like okay this is so awesome right now i'm like, yes. Sarah's going to love this. I love so it. Of I course. would say, let's do it just sure. so that if there's um, questions afterwards, we still have, we can still take some questions too. Um, yeah. But we're rounding about, you know, 25 minutes of time. So I don't want to, I don't want to take away from that. Perfect. Perfect. Well, let's just jump right in a little bit. So how I usually teach this lesson with my students is I'll, of course, read the book at the beginning, and then I highlight this page um, because though we might market something or talk about something as anxiety, there's obviously a lot of like this could be fear, this could be um, uh, you know anger, like there's a lot of things that these feelings could be. So sometimes we can just identify it as like a feelings workshop or a feelings paper instead of specifically anxiety. But um, for me, it works best to phrase it in that way, and I know. Um, through through lots of practice that anxiety shows itself in many different ways, right? So it doesn't always look the same. So I'll talk to them about how I made this page and I layered all these paints and I spray painted and I scribbled and I, um, you know, just kind of like went crazy following my heart to fill in these lines. So I always give them a few different kinds of materials to use to actually scribble over their page. And depending on how much time we have, I might encourage them to, um, to try making a line that evokes a certain kind of emotion. So I'll say, can you make a calm line? Can you make a, um, a hurried line? Can you make a, you know, a, a panicked line, whatever, right? And to try to, to make a line that has its own emotion. Uh, but if I'm doing it with young students, usually I'll just say, all right, it's scribble time, friends. And we just like scribble like crazy. So for those of you that are doing it with us, we are just going to basically fill our page with scribbles and feeling lines and emotion lines and try to kind of cover the paper so that there's like not very much page showing. So we're getting out all of our feelings. Maybe today was a really rough day for you and you gotta like, just like really get those, those scribbles on the paper. I'm gonna try to not color on my book, but you know. <laughs> I also, usually I don't draw in the air like this, but you know. <laughs> You're fine. so talented though. Right, so, so talented, flexible. And you know, the knots um, are a pretty common uh, piece in my work. I often do like these little knots just because I feel like they're kind of beautiful in my opinion. Like I just love how much they overlap with each other and how much, um, how much energy is there, but that they also are, um, they also evoke a lot of feeling. So I'm gonna keep my edges kind of, kind of open here. Mm. And I'm just using um, like some little art sticks, but crayons work. Um, I even had the students that I taught this to virtually that were in the middle school group, they all just used a post-it note and a pencil. So like, it doesn't have to be anything fancy, you know, um, anything to, to make a mark. How are, how are yours coming? I gotta see your progress. Well, and I'm giggling because um, like I seriously am getting um, like all of a sudden, first of all, I completely knocked my earpiece out while I was doing it. So oh, no. clearly getting real passionate about it. 
and then um then you said something about filling it in and so i thought myself like getting <laughs> super nutty um but i do like to do a i do like to do a spiral because i feel yeah. like a spiral defines me yeah and that's I and that's the thing too so show me what does yours look like it's a little let's see it's a little blown out oh well, there no, we go maybe a little bit more here yeah varying lines yeah oh yeah, yeah. look at her yeah she's yeah she's a very horizontal design is yes. what i decided to go for I love it. I love, I love that because I can see her personality right in there. I mean, <laughs> so much fun. Like, yeah. seriously, it's so great because I know you can't really tell, but like up here, it's just sort of like um, sort of scribbly. But then this one is a wavy line. And then this one waves a different way. But then this one starts to get almost heartbeaty. And then uh -huh. you just got like some straight lines across. And then you get like scribble, scribble, scribble. And then then you got a very pattern line so i just this is that's how beautiful that her brain thinks and then there's and then there's chris like again please this is my brain today and especially this week so don't worry if i wasn't drawing in the air it would be even crazier um but it's, it's also really fun because if you do it with a group of people um i know chris you were saying like a spiral is something that you like to draw a lot that you kind of identify with um, it can be hard for a student to pick something that feels so abstract, but if we talk about why, you know, sort of the the uh, more subjective ways in, in the way that a shape or a line could evoke an emotion, um, it's really fun to hear them talk about like, ooh, a circle could kind of mean like, there, it's not very sharp, right? It's kind of calm. Or like a wavy line could kind of feel like you're on a beach and that feels calming, you know? So it's, it's fun to have those conversations because then everything really starts to take on its own meaning and really becomes their the kid's own expression about how they feel, right? Um, so sometimes we'll we'll like stick our name into it, you know. You can like write your name and scribble in there too, so it's very much your um, your creation. There you go. I just did mine too, but you can't even tell where it was. But wrote Sarah in there. <laughs> well, and I always feel like if you use like black, like that's just, you know, that's Ooh, powerful, crazy. you know, gets a little crazy. I did throw a lot of yellow in there because I do always want that sun to shine and I always want that light to come through. Now you've inspired me, Chris, with the black. I'm really going to. Oh, yeah, you, you get, you know. Oh, yep. yes, that definitely feels like what you just described your yep. week and day, your <laughs> Thursday brain. Yes, it is. But again, not to be like aggressively positive, but like that is still beautiful, right? I, I agree. Mean, I am so, I know, I'm so sort of loving this too. Yeah. yeah. And also, I feel like black, like black gets a really bad rap sometimes. Yeah. But ultimately, like it's like dark, dark brown, and and black is soil, right? And that's like yes. the dirt that we all grow out of, and like the the sustaining of life needs black. Yeah. Well, it's and like, I yeah. intentionally, I'm so sorry. See how excited we get? <laughs> I intentionally put some brown in there because I have like this is one of those weeks where. Um, it, and, and quite honestly, this entire year, I have become so much more aware of other colors. And so I just wanted to show um, a little bit of my social awareness in there as well. Nice. All that all that symbolism in, in every choice we make for sure. OK, well, if you're feeling ready, let's let's move on to our next step, because this is how we usually start the conversation. So we've got our feelings on a paper. We've got our scribbles. We've got the whole thing sort of covered um, so that we we have part of us out here on this page. So next, what you're going to do is you're going to cut out a circle from the center of your page. And I always ask kids, I say, if you don't want to cut in from the edge of your page, how could you cut a circle? Hold it. You can fold it. Now, sometimes that means you're going to get a weird looking circle, but that's fine. So if you don't want to do the, the cutting in from the edge, you could cut your circle while it's folded. Let's see how I do. And it's going to be like, oh, it's not bad. Okay. I'll, I'll count that. Okay. So we're going to have a background and a circle, and we need both pieces for this particular project. So 
what we could okay. do and what um, what I've done with this project uh, many times before is like take in um, the circle and we sort of like mount it so it's like it's popping up off the page. We do some like different embellishments on this part. We do um, like a really cool background that's got all these patterns and printed and stuff like that too. But to do the basic version today, we're going to use these as sort of visual conversation um, interactive pieces. So what I'll tell the students is that I'd like you to hold up your circle only. And this circle is your circle of control. So it symbolizes what you can control. So there's things inside this circle that even though they're a little bit tricky, are things that you in fact are in control over, okay? So that's our circle of control. Now we're gonna lift up the background. And all my students are like doing weird, fun eye movements because you can't help but be like kind of fun, <laughs> right? Like, hello. Um, so this is outside our circle of control. Right? So everything that we cannot control is out here. It lives out in this outside space. So when we start asking questions and having a conversation about what we can control and what we can't, I've done this with many students and on like in visual um, online learning, it's really fun because then they just like hold up what they're feeling or hold up what they think. So I'll then pose a question. So we'll start with, with a relatively simple question. And what I want you to do, and those of you that are doing it at home with us, if you'd like to maybe just hold it up or just think in your head as you hear the question, um, we are going to try to see if we can figure out if that thing that we say is in our circle of control or if it's not, okay? So for example, I always start with the question, can you control the weather? In your control or out of your control? Okay, right? So then we could have a quick conversation saying, okay, we got to be prepared for the weather. We have to be prepared for if it's going to rain. It looks like it's stormy out right now. I can't control it, but I can be prepared for it. Okay, let's try this one. Can you control what people say? What other people say? No, right? Oh, That's gosh. outside your circle of control. And that one's a hard one for kids because we want to be able to control it, but we can't. So then I'll ask a question and I'll say something like this. Can you control how you react to what someone says? Right, and now all of a sudden we're like, ooh, this becomes in my circle of control. So my reaction is something that I can control, right? Then we started having some other conversations and I would pose it to, to my students and say, all right, the question starts, can you control? And then I need you to help me think of a way to end it. So they would say things like, can you control the future? Okay, so do that one with me. Can you control the future? That's, I feel like you can control yeah, parts right. of the future. Oh, yeah, yeah. right? All of a sudden. <laughs> but, picture, but picture the conversation that you have with a bunch of, you know, elementary, middle school, high school students about like, okay, can I control the future? Well, my decisions influence the future. You know what I mean? Do I have a flux capacitator? <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> Can I in fact change the future, right? So there's so many, there's so many conversations yeah. about that. And then of course we talked about like, um, can you control coronavirus? That was one that was really interesting. What are your thoughts mm -hmm. on that? It's kind of both. Right? That's another one, right? So we said there are things that you that you don't have the ability to control, but there are things you can do to try to prevent it. So the nice thing is that once I've taught this lesson to all my students, now I'll use the phrase circle of control almost daily because it's something that they are aware of. And I actually, I don't, I haven't had the time to do it yet, but I wanna make like a huge scribble circle in my classroom so that I can use it as a visual reference and then like a background so that I can say, you know, when something's in your circle of control or, or not, they can be reminded of that in a nice visual way. Um, but it's even as simple as saying, okay, Mrs. K can't control your body and your words. I can only give you the tools to try to be successful, right? That's my job is to help you, but I can't control it. So you are in control of your body and giving them more control than they think. And then uh, the last part of that conversation that can be really fun is once they, let's say we have a few more um, questions about something that's outside of your circle of control. For example, like, um we said what somebody says maybe someone's actions right can you control someone's actions no but is there anything you can do to bring it inside your circle of control right or um like here's a good one we said can you control someone's feelings and the answer we said was no i can't control chris how you feel or how you react but what i can do is i can try to make you feel better in my own way 
and, and, and fix what I can to try to help you, right? So it starts a deeper conversation about where their control is, how they probably have more control than they think, and what is outside the control that just needs to be let go, you know? Such a great lesson. Like, I love this. And like I said, I was just like, with my boss, I'm like, well, and at the end of the day, it just comes down to the circle of control. I mean, and, <laughs> and I'm not joking yet. Right. It was, the circle of it was a perfect visual. <laughs> yeah. And it's definitely not something that was invented by me. I'm merely using it as a symbol for being able to talk about that circle of control as a visual reminder. So it's kind of this interpretation with the scribble and the anxiety. Um, but I think what's the nicest thing about it is it is it gives you um, something to come back to when you're feeling a little bit overwhelmed or a little bit lost. And it gives you sort of this jumping off point to say, all right, like even tonight, I should probably do this in my head because I'm, I'm having a more anxious sort of overwhelmed week is think, okay, Sarah, what, what can you control even tonight? Well, you can control what you eat. You can control if you stretch, you can control um, if you, if you rest or if you journal, um, but you can't control what you have to do tomorrow right now, you know? So it, it helps gain that perspective and give you the ability to um, kind of take a taste of your own medicine that you would, <laughs> you would end up giving to your students anyways. <laughs> That is fantastic. I do wonder if there's another book coming or that original book. So here's here's what I'll say. I would absolutely love to write another one. It is on my on my agenda. Um, I know um, this summer I need to I need to take a little break from uh, from writing because this year was both good and uh, the hardest year ever. <laughs> So I'm excited to kind of, my, my mom said, and again, remember my mom is a teacher too. So we were talking about how much um, COVID is trauma and what we can do as educators and people to work through that trauma. And my mom was saying that um, she wants to use her summer to heal. And I like that term in particular because um, I feel, feel that sometimes as a teacher, I'm like, oh, I'm going to refresh, I'm going to rejuvenate, I'm going to get myself you know, energized. But I think thinking of that as healing is a really beautiful way to help process the trauma of um, this this past school year. So um, I'll be healing this summer, um, <laughs> but I do still want to do aspects of that first book. So definitely, yeah, I don't think there's going to be only one book. I don't know. We'll see. But I'd like. I like it. Well, we are super excited because Sarah has given us permission. Um, and you need to tell people where to buy the book. NASCO doesn't sell the book, but Sarah has given us permission to um, create a kit where we will purchase the book and put it inside the kit and then the materials that go with it just to help classrooms and um, teachers and all kinds of people um, do these kinds of lessons and then hopefully think of more. But Sarah, share where to buy the book right now. Yeah, yeah, there's a few places you're you're um, welcome to look on Amazon. Just type in exactly you and you should be able to find it there. Otherwise, I always say the easiest place to go is just my website, which is artroomglitterfairy.com. Again, artroomglitterfairy.com. That's also my Instagram handle and you can follow my link there as well. And right on my website, I have a tab that says, order my book exactly the shape of your feelings. And it'll take you to my publisher's page. Yeah, the the world should buy it. It's a great thing and you have changed the world by putting it out there. You change the world every day when you teach and I I can't thank you enough for all the joy that you have brought to me. Um any other questions that we have? We still have time for maybe a couple questions sure. yet. Um I don't see any others that have come in. Um but I would love to know about the background of your name. Art on Art Room Glitter Fairy? Yeah. Um, okay. I'm, I'm writing down my notes. Um, yes. So like I said, I've been teaching for 10 years and, um, I, in, in a strange, weird way, I always wanted to like use glitter in my classroom, but it's impossible to just like give kids a glitter jar and have it not make a mess. It's insane, right? It's, it's chaos. 
So I was like, okay, well, how can I do it where it's like just Mrs. K gets to touch the glitter, like only me. So I invented this character, which was the glitter fairy. So anytime the kids were using glitter, they would be the glue fairies. So they glue on where they want their glitter to be on their project. And then they come visit the glitter fairy and the glitter I always wore like, and I still do this, um, but I have like wings and a tutu and like a little crown. And I'm like, oh, the glitter fairy's here. And I pretend that like Mrs. K is gone for a second and that like I know all their names. It's this whole thing. It's very silly. So then only the glitter fairy gets to touch the glitter, but that is my secret way of making sure there is classroom management, not chaos. Um, and so then I'll do all the glitter shaking for them and then and they just get to like come and watch it all happen. So that's always a really fun thing. Um, I also I'm going to do a quick plug because I have recently gotten some really cool um, biodegradable glitter, which is really cool because as you may or may not know, glitter is actually not great for the environment because it's microplastics. So I'm trying to not use glitter anymore, which I, at this point I feel like I can't change my name, but I can advocate for glitter substitution. So we also use, I'll do like a bunch of little paper scraps are super cool, like paper glitter. Um, and then there's really beautiful um, biodegradable glitter, which looks exactly the same, but it's just like a slightly more of an investment by like you know, a little bit if you're not gonna use glitter that much. Anyway, so that is where um, the name came from. And my um, my kids will, my students will still ask me like, oh, is the glitter fairy coming today? Are we using glitter? You know, it's very silly. Sarah, are you open to um, doing these kinds of workshops and reading your book and things like that? Um, you know, if somebody wanted to invite you to their classroom, is that something you're open to do? Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I definitely, obviously, as a, a full-time teacher, sometimes it's hard to schedule all those little things, especially this year, but I'm happy to be kind of um, be be asked about it. I did um, a couple book chats already this year. I um, spoke virtually to about 60 first graders a couple weeks ago in like a nearby district of one that I didn't even didn't even teach at, and they just hooked me up with a Zoom link, and I was like, the virtual author which was super fun so um you can you can contact me through my website or message me on my instagram if um if anyone wants to get a hold of me yeah you need to have some place where you can um sign somebody else's book <laughs> oh you got it i'm trying to make any not trying to not trying to make anybody jealous but you know what i'm saying i get what you're saying well we can hook that up there chris don't you worry <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I can't thank you enough for being here and this kind of stuff is just priceless. It, it really is. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. I learned so much today um, for your expertise and, and thank you to everyone who tuned in today as well. Um, we appreciate the time that you, you spend with us. We love these webinars and we, we hope to see you again. Yes, thank Thanks, you everyone. Sarah.